Can, can every — I always feel silly asking this, is can you hear me, and then how — if you can't — yes, excellent. Uh, we have an absolutely terrific panel here for you today. Uh, I could probably spend the entire hour and 20 minutes talking about their credentials and their accomplishments, but I will cut it short. Um, and so let me introduce our extraordinary panel in alphabetical order. Uh, Elizabeth Churchill. Uh, Elizabeth is a director of user experience at Google. She is also uh, a vice president of ACM, our parent organization. And uh, she is co-chair of the CHI 2030 vision, which I think uh, she would like to encourage you to provide some feedback for. Um, it's, it's an exciting opportunity to think about where this is all headed. So perhaps she can, uh, before we, we end, she can talk a little bit about that. Our uh, second panelist is Elizabeth Gerber, who is the Charles Deering McCormick Professor of Teaching Excellence. Wow. Uh, and uh, at <laughs> Northwestern University. She's also the founder of Design for America, which is an extraordinary program. Um, and uh, perhaps you can say a little more about that as we talk about it. Elizabeth Rosenzweig, who uh, I have known for many, many years, uh, is on the faculty of Bentley University. She's been a UX consultant. And uh, she is the founding, founder of World Usability Day, uh, which has had a truly international thing. And she's also part of the CHI 2030 Vision Task Force. Um, Ben Schneiderman. Ben and I were college buddies back in the days when computers filled rooms this size. And uh, he has been, you know, his career is probably well known to you. He's, he's just had an extraordinary career and made major contributions. He's a distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland. Um, and my name is Charlie Kreitzberg. Uh, I'm a senior user experience advisor at Princeton University. So that's our panel. Let me ask you all, how many of you are familiar with the concept of digital transformation? Okay, and how many are not? <laughs> so I'd say about two-thirds are and one-third are not. Uh, a little bit of field research there. Uh, I'm going to provide a little bit of background to frame the conversation that we're going to have. Uh, so to do that, let me start off with um, a picture of Mark Andreessen, a uh, venture capitalist, and of course the development of one of the original, the Netscape browser. And he wrote a very influential article in 2011, which he titled, Software is Eating the World. And that we're in the middle of a transformational shift, which is affecting everybody. It's affecting technology, business, government, and all of the institutions therein, uh, and that has been called digital transformation. Um, the foundation of what I want to present to you today is encapsulated in this phrase, that digital transformation, or DX, requires user experience. It's going to be a new role for us, a different way for us to operate, and I think all very, very good indeed. So in the old days, when I first entered the field uh, of computing, uh, information technology was a service organization. It was separate from the business. And it had its own culture, and it wasn't terribly human-oriented. And UX, by its nature, ended up somehow embedded within the information technology department. But that is now shifting in major ways, and information technology is totally integrated into organizations. Uh, here's an example. Go back only 10 years. Let's talk about what in, in buying a book was involved. Uh, somebody said I might have to show a book because people wouldn't even remember what it was. <laughs> so you might start off by picking up the Sunday paper and reading some book reviews. And then you would go visit a bookstore down the block You'd wander around, you'd pick the books you wanted off the shelves, and then you'd take them to the cash register, you'd purchase the book, you'd carry it home, curl up, and read the book back at your home. 
And to be sure, there were many information processing systems involved in this process, but they were distinct pretty much from each other. They were not integrated. Uh, if they did speak to each other, it was through a process of batch import export, and time lags happened from one to the other. Now, just 10 years later, let's say you wanted to purchase a book from Amazon. You would have not a trip to the bookstore, but a user journey, um, which was involving a single website. You'd start off by creating an account. You'd browse the catalog. You'd re read crowdsourced user reviews. You'd make the purchase online. You'd provide your credit card. You would download the ebook to your Kindle or to your iPad, and then you would read it on the device. And there are two major differences in what and how this was different from the earlier. One is that the product itself went from a physical product to a digital product. And the other thing is that the systems are completely integrated. To the user, there was one seamless experience. The user thinks, oh, I'm on a website and I'm doing a bunch of things on this website to get my book. But in reality, you're accessing many different corporate systems behind the scenes, and those cannot operate in batch mode. You can't sort of take system one and say, come back in 24 hours and we'll let you see, you know, what books you can purchase. All of these need to operate in real time, which presupposes a very different architecture. That basically is the architecture of digital transformation. And I think the key point is that when software is everywhere, usability is essential. When people struggle to interact with technology, they can't use the services. It hurts people, it hurts communities, it hurts organizations. And in fact, a recent McKinsey report suggested that organizations that truly do not understand user experience are likely to go out of business. So <clears throat> one of the major things that's happening is that the design of software, websites, software products, has shifted and is shifting from inside, what I call inside out to outside in. So traditionally, software sort of started with the organization saying, oh, we need some sort of new product. Let's talk about what it is. And we get to the user at the end of the process. Now we need to start with the user. We have to understand the context of use, who the individual is, and HCI and UX must lead. And that suggests that we have a different role. Our role is no longer simply being craftspeople, but it becomes central, it becomes strategic. And that means we need a whole new set of skills, we need new education, by the way, something that's happening not only within the HCI and UX field, but is happening to information technology in general. And this is not only happening in business, this is happening all over. And so digital transformation is creating opportunities such as those listed on the slides in education, in environment, in education, in justice, in economic development, in yeah. safety, all of these all sorts of governmental issues, political issues, the connections, the relationships among countries and economies are all becoming highly digital. One of the things that's absolutely essential in this environment is that everybody must have access. If we don't ensure universal usability, accessibility, and inclusiveness, then we are denying people access to the most important elements of these services. And um, <clears throat> the uh, United Nations has established a set of sustainability goals. And this might actually be a good moment for me to invite you to speak about it, Elizabeth. Okay. Thank you. So um, in preparing for this, uh, we were talking about aspirations and um, bringing our work to a higher level. So introduce World Usability Day, where we are trying, our theme this year is designing for the future that we want. And the idea is to try to connect ourselves to something larger than us, to have an impact, not just in our companies, but, or our universities, but to do work that makes us bigger. So we connect to these goals as a way of, of you know, bringing it forward. I don't know. 
Ben wanted to say anything more about that. Okay. Uh, I think we'll come back to it, but I think the central story of this panel is that the work of this community 30 years ago produced the world we have today, the World Wide Web, the, the social computing, the social media, electronic commerce, uh, all of those services, mobile devices, touch screens, etc., all of that came from the people who attended the early versions of this conference. It took 30 years, but we have changed the world in this substantial way because, as Charlie said, we were devoted to universal usability, inclusiveness, and diversity. We really thought about how young and old, men and women, uh, rich and poor, literate and illiterate, abled and disabled could all participate. That's the central message. And that is still playing out. So I say to the young people here, that's your future. You are going to change the world. To the people who are a little older and working or teaching, you need to inspire your students and you can inspire your colleagues to reshape the world based on the themes that come from this community. We have been essential to the fact that five billion people have something like this in their pockets. They can use it for communicating, for getting health information, for education, for business, and for all those important factors. We'll come back to those themes. And in the spirit of growth, I'll just add, ben, you added men and women, and I'll add, his, uh, I really appreciate this conference, the inclusiveness of gender. So we're <laughs> always making progress. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'd like to keep the discussion as open as possible, as informal as possible. I'm sure we're all adults in this room, so I don't think we have to wait. You know, if you have a pressing question, please raise your hand and we'll, we'll provide you with a microphone. Um, we have some questions to more or less guide the conversation. Uh, so let me just start by posing some of these. So the first is around our role how digital transformation is changing the field, and what does it mean for people who are currently in the field and for those who seek to enter it? And let me just ask you folks on the panel, do you have any thoughts here? <laughs> Hopefully a few. <laughs> um, yeah, so part of it is, I think, as I was saying before, our role, I, I see it as uh, our role is two levels, to act locally, to do what we can with our projects, with our communities, with our service projects, but to think about where we're going in a larger scale, uh, sort of what Ben was saying and what the sustainability goals to take us to a higher level. Because sometimes when people struggle with technology, it's annoying. But sometimes it's a life and death problem, like with a medical device, or a democracy problem if people are struggling to get their votes counted with a machine that doesn't work well. So our work is really important, and I just want to encourage us to be thinking on these two levels. Uh, yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that uh, bringing a lot of our ideas into tools and infrastructure is also really important. So not everybody can be touching everything and bringing great human-centered and human-value-centered design um, into products and artifacts. So one of the things that I've been working on and my teams work on is infrastructure. So looking from the operating system level up to the tools that designers and developers use and giving designers and developers who may not have the training that we have some of the tools but some of the kind of critical rhetorical ways of thinking about people and users by providing them with great tools. Uh, Material Design is Google's design system. It's open source, it's out. And millions and millions and millions of apps are using some of the guidelines that Material offers, uh, using some of the components that Material has engineered that's available in Git. And imbued within those are values and design assumptions that have been tested that are human-centered. So even if we can't touch the, the things, the products themselves, thinking about how we can actually create infrastructures and platforms and architectures that imbue some of the things we value, I think is also very, very important. And that's a different way of thinking about HCI. That's a different way of thinking about UX. It's about really transforming the production processes um, of, of those who may not have uh, the privilege of our training. So think about how one can influence through those mechanisms as well. So just follow up a little bit on that. In 
if, if we do have to interact with these folks in new ways, what kinds of skills do we need to have that we currently perhaps don't have? Well, if I was just to follow up with the sorts of things that I do, and we had a conversation earlier, I think one of the things that we have not always focused on in training and teaching and mentoring is that communication is the most important thing. We were talking about you know, hiring brilliant folks who have come out of courses with PhDs and masters and undergraduate degrees, and they have brilliant skills, the craft skills that uh, Charlie was mentioning. But we often fail to teach them how to do translation work and transdisciplinary communication and how to understand the context within which they work in collaboration with other disciplines. And so I think a great thing for the future is for us to really focus on teaching folks and teaching ourselves how much of our work is really about influence through effective communication, negotiation, discussion, and leading through uh, being role models uh, that, you know, to uh, bring the values that we believe very explicitly into the discourse. Thank you. Uh, let me respond to that. Thank you. Build on Elizabeth and Elizabeth's comment um, about the training that we need and specifically then how we do it. I think the, the real skill that many of us have and we don't actually get to ask, I'm a professor in higher ed, is um, why and really get at the core underlining cause of a challenge or an opportunity area we see. Um, and I think often the disservice we do is each, with our skill, with our craft, is um, solve whatever problem we think with the technology at hand. So there's an app for that, um, right? We've all heard this. There's an app for everything. Um, and yet in my work with Design for America, which involves undergraduate students working in their local communities, we've found that by teaching them why, asking why, 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 um, they'll often get to a, to a very different framing of the original, the original opportunity. And that that framing it won't necessarily involve technology. Um, a very concrete, uh, concrete example is uh, some students working with a local community health center, and there was concern about access to the digital records um, among these among these folks. And um, they were trying to the the digital healthcare, or rather, excuse me, the health community center wanted the students to redesign the interface. And actually, the the real challenge was is that most people couldn't act most of their um, Patients couldn't access these records without going to the library and reserving a spot at the computer um, for an hour on the internet to check their records. And so the, the solution, once they found out what really what the challenge was, they were able to come up with a solution that was um, really quite elegant and simple and allowed these, these folks to get access to the records. So ask why. Uh, I want to return to this point about getting out there and doing something real. This panel is superstar people who all have their PhDs in wonderful ways and, you know, <laughs> done great work. But what they're characterized by is getting out there and doing something in the real world. And that's what makes a difference. So, again, for the students in there, I, I heard about 40 talks, maybe many of you also, in the last four days. I've been listening to sessions, and I've heard some wonderful things, and I've heard some things that trouble me. But I would say the ones I resonated to and the ones I thought this has a future were those that got out of the lab, they got into the street, they got into the village, they went somewhere and they worked on a real problem for real people and they delivered value, okay? And so that's where it's going and that's what I've been trying to represent. So if you're a professor, you want to get your students aligned in teams that work on real projects and real situations. You, if you're doing research, you want to get out of the lab. I, I'm tired of the Mechanical Turk studies. I'm tired of the lab studies. Get out there and get to work with real people. Deliver value during your PhD, during your research, and that work is more likely to have the long-term durable impact. One more note that I just want to resonate, another powerful way of impact is by building tools. And the way this community has changed the world is because the thousand people in this community worked on guidelines and studies. Those guidelines got embedded in the tools that a million developers used and those million developers produce those apps that a billion users have used. And that propagation effect, that exponential effect, is where your power is. So just think about 
think locally, do something small, something powerful. I mean, Charlie and I, collaboration was over the link, okay, in the mid-80s. The idea of highlighted words in the middle of a paragraph, and you click on them. Charlie ran the company that turned that academic idea into a commercial success story. We built the systems for the ACM, and that is what Tim Berners-Lee saw and cited in his Spring 89 Manifesto for the Web. And that's why the links on your browser are light blue, because we tested them. We did a series of studies about different ways that links work. So sometimes small ideas travel out and be and have powerful. So work on the small ideas, think big. I have to say, I'm still waiting for my royalties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a question. I see a question. Uh, I'd, Gillian Crampton-Smith. I'd like to uh, just pick up on what Ben said, that over 30 years, we've changed the world. But I don't think we were cynical enough um, because we didn't think about what might go wrong. And I think we've seen just recently in the past three or four years exactly how things are going really badly wrong. And so I would say to everybody, be a bit cynical. Think as well about what could go wrong. Thank you, yeah, certainly. Go ahead. Good. So I know, uh, without getting into specifics, I have a pretty good sense of what you're talking about. <laughs> and um, there are unintended consequences of our work, and that's why iteration is really important, because we don't know what we don't know. So we we got to put you know one foot in front of the other, we do the best we can, and then we learn. So I think we have a lot to learn about certain technologies right now. I think we all lived in a world where we thought people were virtuous and positive and oriented along the lines that we were. But there are malicious actors, there are terrorists, there are criminals, and there are people who misuse or put these powerful tools to work for purposes that trouble us. And I think we should rightly be the leaders in stepping forward and pushing the companies who now control these technologies to actually make those changes. There are things that can be done. Uh, there's the positive effort within, for example, Google rising up the employees to say, no, we won't work on this kind of work. And other places, courageous employees, bold students, academic leaders are standing up and saying, it's our job to fix it. So let's get out there, do that part, while we build the next generation of even better systems. I think um, I certainly was cynical about a lot of things, <laughs> but I underestimated just, just how powerful the negative could be. Um, and so I think in this room, we talk a lot about ethics, and a lot of people are calling for corporations and design teams to have ethicists. And not to just talk about the big things, but be very practical, back to Ben's comment about the small things. I also think we need – one of the reasons – being in a community like this is very important, is that you do have a community to reflect on things with. You have a place that you can call home, if you like. And if you look at the ACM Code of Ethics, it has a series of recommendations, which is that nobody should be forced to work outside of their area of competence. Because one of the things that we're seeing is that a lot of technologies are built by people who actually don't have deep competence, haven't had deep training. Uh, we can look at some of the machine learning activities that are going on. Um, they, people do not fully understand the consequences of what they're doing. They don't even necessarily understand the technology itself that well, but it's easy enough to pick up and run with something. So try not to work outside your area of competence. Try to think about the organizational context in which you are uh, asked to work and reflect on what you're doing. I don't know how we do that in terms of supporting people in organizations, but I think a first start is to say that you do have a community that will support the conversation around you and help you think through those things that you are being asked to do. Um, I'm a big, big proponent of, is, I think it's De Bono's, the six hats, five hats, however many hats. And uh, one of the things I love to do is to have people take roles. So if somebody uh, in the team is very, very well trained in research, I say, okay, now put on the hat of a business development person. What do you think the incentive mechanisms are for them to promote and or stop something happening? Put on the hat of someone who's uh, in legal 
What do you think their incentive mechanisms are? Mm -hmm. So like I was talking about translation in terms of language, I think translation in terms of taking the perspective of the other so that you can start to see what are the conflicting incentives that people are under or that teams are under. And you can then imagine that organizational and societal and and business structures within which something that you're working on is likely to be taken up and or promoted and or not and or potentially from your perspective distorted. So I think these ways of thinking, so Gillian, thanks for bringing that up. And I think cynicism is the first step, but actually practically thinking about what are the potential consequences from different perspectives and where the incentives are likely to be is really, really, really critical. So my team called me uh, the dark princess of dystopia, which I like. Because <laughs> not just dystopia, but the dark princess. Let, let's hope constructive cynicism is what you meant. <laughs> thank you. Yes, and exactly. I, I want to I build on Elizabeth. Um, Point. Thank you very much, and thank you for, I really appreciate that comment. Um, I think one of the challenges that we face as uh, professionals is that when you're new in your career, it can be scary to have these conversations and question yes. the, the, um, the value of what you're creating. And so, again, I'm going to make a plea and a call to action for the educators out there to have these, allow our uh, students to have these experiences in which they're working with many different people in higher ed, even in, in high school, and they're actually able to have, they're able to develop trust and have conversations. And so instead of this, I think this, oh, this is being recorded. So instead of the siloed, <laughs> I love siloed organizations. Uh, I love majors, but I do, I do think that we should work more across, um, across different majors and disciplines. So we should have policy students working with, um, working with economists, working with designers, working with um, psychologists, because it's in those small teams when they're working on real projects that they get to ask these questions of each other and get these perspectives in a way that feel um, less threatening to their career uh, and, and allow them a chance to educate themselves and, and talk openly with each other. Yeah. Well, so some of these ideas are very noble, and there is an ugly <laughs> reality uh, and that is that if many of these things to be influential have to happen within organizations. And once we deal with organizations, we're dealing with HR, we're dealing with people who may or may not understand the roles that we play. So let's talk about uh, how HR departments understand HCI and UX, um, how it impacts the hiring process, how we can get past those structures, and whether, you know, it's a problem of putting people into boxes and are we excluding the most creative and interesting people because they don't fit perfectly? Any thoughts about that? I'm being looked at. <laughs> um, I think most HR departments um, are responsive to the needs of the organization. Um, I work with a couple of extremely good uh, HR folks. And I think it, it, one needs to make sure that the senior leadership in an organization understand what is needed to create products that are really meaningful and business relevant. And I think as one, as I was saying, as we start to get a different kind of voice and move to that strategic set of conversations, and influence senior leadership, that will influence the HR uh, structures and the HR uh, settings within which we work. We were talking earlier, um, Elizabeth, you said something lovely about, you know, job descriptions or job titles are for sorting people. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's about sorting people into organizational structures to create kind of like you know, efficient mechanisms for productivity, whatever one might want to call that. And that sounds horribly sort of reductionist. And I'm intentionally doing that a little bit. But, you know, in an organization like the one I work in, um, I've been very active in looking at the job ladder and uh, thinking about whether the job ladder reflects the skill sets that are coming out, but also the career trajectories that we want to help people develop into so that they can have successful careers within our org, but potentially somewhere else. Because I really strongly believe that great mentorship and developing people creates an alumni network that is absolutely, you know, important in, in, in our field, but, you know, you want to grow people. So I've been very happily um, 
involved in writing job ladders and writing different kinds of lenses onto work. And I think that that kind of work needs to happen, whether you're an educator um, thinking about the courses that are coming up yeah. or you're, like me, in, in uh, you know, industry thinking about the job ladder as a course that you want to help people develop into mm -hmm. that's reflective of what is needed, mm -hmm. please be in those conversations. And I personally have, have had really good uh, partnerships with my HR folks. But have the strategic conversations and think of these as part of your job. It's really important. So I just want to, oh, well, let me just give a thought. In that. Um, so when I talk to my students about this, uh, we spend a lot of time on, on their portfolios and how they want to present themselves. And I think that's something to think about, especially for, for you guys who are out there who will then, or are looking. Um, I do practice interviews. I, I go through stuff with them. And I think if you can find someone to help you walk through that, uh, then you'll get a better sense of what you're facing when you go in and talk to an HR person or something. Should we? Did, didn't, I know Elizabeth had a... Hi. Hi, Elizabeth Bowie, Elizabeth Sigma Consulting Solutions. Right. Yeah, we don't have enough Elizabeths here, so... <laughs> um, I think that a lot of UX work is done by small companies, small agencies, who don't necessarily have a lot of roles. Um, the company that I work for, we're about 35 people, and we have, I don't know, eight or 10 people on the UX team. Some of them are front-end designers. Some of us are user researchers. And um, the roles aren't really um, finely delimited, because we take advantage of whatever skills and knowledge that we have as appropriate to the project. But my point is that there's just not, we have one HR person, there's not a formal structure for this. And so I think the, but I think, prob, I don't know how much, it would be interesting to find the statistics, but an awful lot of UX work is done by small agencies. And so the discussion about you know, that comes out of large companies is valid for large companies and may not be applicable to smaller companies. So I think we need to consider a wider variety of UX practice work. So I think one of the oh, sorry. one of the advantages of being in a smaller company is that you actually often have very direct dialogue with HR and with setting uh, job descriptions and with interviewing and so forth. So I think yeah. that's a really good point. Um, and I think it's about making sure that the communication really is there and is very rich. So I think that's a, yes. a nice point. Well, our job descriptions don't come from HR. We, we tell her who we want to hire. And you know, she manages the, the logistics and the formalities. But, um, but she doesn't make hiring decisions. No, sure, so, and we don't yeah. either in, in, mm -hmm. uh, at all. But HR usually is uh, really good at, once people are in, making sure that you know, if they're on the ladder or if they want to yes. change the ladder. We, we have conversations, but I like this point that the rich dialogue is really important and it might yes. be a different conversation in different sizes of the company. Okay, thank yeah. you. Nice. Got a question Jeff. from Jeff. Yeah. So that the people in the room get to know you, can you say your name and where you're from? Uh, my name is Jeff Johnson. I'm from the University of San Francisco. Um, a couple of years ago, Austin Henderson and I wrote an article in the Journal of Usability Studies um, called uh, World Usability, It Will Get Worse Before It Gets Better. <laughs> and the, the reason for that was that, as you say, the world is digitizing. And because of that, there are a lot of there are a lot of companies out there. there okay, there are companies like Google that, that sponsor Kai and other companies that, that know uh, about the value of this, this line of work. But there are a lot of companies out there, as the world digitizes, that were not in a digital business at all before and are now moving into one. Like some of my consulting clients before I became a professor were companies that made test tubes and Bunsen burners, but now they make DNA analysis machines. Okay. And so they're having to move forward into the digital world without necessarily having the benefit of our skills. Uh, now, one can consult for those companies, but some of them don't even know that this field exists. Um, and so my concern, and, uh, and Austin Henderson's concern that we expressed in that article, was that there are not enough of us to cover all the companies that are now coming into the, the digital world and that we have to 
figure out a way to amplify our knowledge. And I think Elizabeth was talking about platforms, creating platforms that, and, and tools. I think that was, I say Elizabeth, I have to say which Elizabeth. <laughs> So, there's only there are two non Elizabeths up there. We wore different colors to help we, you. We tried to get everyone, Jeff, to be Elizabeth, but Ben refused to change his name, and if he wouldn't, I wouldn't. I went so far, I changed my name to Elizabeth, so you can. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you get my point. I don't need to continue it. So, I, can you respond? I'm gonna, I, wouldn't, I want to respond, Jeff. Thank you very much for that point. And I, I think the issue comes at um, how closely or how narrowly we want to define user experience and who we want to expose the, who we want to invite in. And I think the more people we invite in, the more people there will be. That also means the, the less, the, the, the skill level will be diffuse. So not everybody will know the same thing. And I think there's an attention there of keeping um, standards around our, our field and what it means and what it means to be a practitioner. Or a, 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 we were just having a conversation earlier about the word practitioner, what it means to be a designer, and then um, versus um, exposing everyone, as many as we can, and saying it's okay if you only have exposure to a, you know, a, few, a few of these tools. It's better than nothing. And I'm, I tend to be on the camp of let's invite everybody in because I want to live in a world in which our doctors and our, our the, everyone, I want to live in a world in which everybody knows about user experience, um, even if it's at different levels of depth. So I just want to build on that. Um, I know uh, many of you know Steve Krug, whose work is basically going in that direction to just teach uh, people and organizations to do usability testing on their own. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, not to poo-poo all of our degrees, but that some of this is better than nothing and that at least getting out there and, and getting something happening is good, mm -hmm. and, I, and I encourage that. I think that's still valuable and helpful, and it's one way to go about what you were just saying. Well, I, I actually think we're beginning to circle around the absolute core issue. Uh, there was another question or comment first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's get that first. <coughs> uh, I'm Stephen Clark, Microsoft. So just following up on the points, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. I've been a UX researcher for 20 years, and in the last uh, few years, uh, we've taken a big effort in our division to train everybody to do UX research. We have a division of about 3,500 people, about 15 UX researchers. You know, it, it doesn't scale on our own. And to begin with, as a team of UX researchers, when we were told, okay, we're going to help the whole division do this, of course, immediately we think, are we training ourselves out of a job? And so we have to give up that feeling where, you know, going back to the earlier point about UX leading, we have to give up the, the notion that by leading means we are doing it. You know, by leading, we are taking the whole division, the whole product, the whole group with us mm -hmm. and learning what we were originally learning on our own. Uh, and I was in a, a, a thread with somebody about this other day, and I reflected on it and I thought, wow, you know, the more I give away my skills, you know, the more... I've never been so busy in my 20 years at Microsoft. So the more I give away my skills, the more work I'm actually doing. And there's just more and more people just keep coming and want more and more and more. And it is, I mean, in my 20 years at Microsoft, this is a, one of the best times yet. I just have so many people want to know how do our users think. So I just, I, I think I absolutely, totally agree with everything you're saying. I, just want to say that. Bravo for you. And I think that's the path we are on. And I hope every one of you will become that kind of uh, educator for everyone else. I mean, in, in a way, HCI and user experience design is like yoga. You know, there are, <laughs> you are all the yoga instructors, but pretty soon everybody will be doing yoga. And that's good. Now, they won't all get it right, and they won't all be beautiful, but you will be setting the standard about how yoga gets done, and you will be advancing the art of yoga and the, the, the excellence of yoga. I mean, that's kind of a, a playful one, but I think the same transition happened with photography. 150 years ago, there were tens of thousands of photographers and, and they were, you came to them for photography. And what happened as the tools became, as George Eastman's East Kodak camera in 1880s and now the cell phone, everybody's a photographer. Now, not everyone's a great photographer. Not every picture is wonderful, but everyone is a photographer. And there are still exceptional photographers that we look to 
to advance the state of the art. Now, one of the things that Sig Kai and the people in this room should be doing is celebrating the work of the leaders in this field. We have done very well within the Sig Kai community of talking to each other, building ourselves, but we have not done our sufficient job in reaching out. Over the years, the Sig Kai Conference has not drawn the kind of attention and journalistic participation and public, you know, we haven't made the cover of Time Magazine, yet, you know, robots are on the cover of Time Magazine. And, you know, user interface needs to be, I guess Time Magazine's an old metaphor, but we need to be... <laughs> We, we need to be on the front of BuzzFeed pretty regularly, right? So we want to be there, and we should become the cultural focus of, of, of how we've created this new world, and we will continue. And I just, again, I want to think, this is, this is just, be, we're just beginning, you know, the best is yet to come. In 20 years, when some of you are sitting on a panel like this, you know, you're going to tell a story, a yet even more ambitious story about how participatory design, how healthcare, how community action, all those things have been transformed by the work of people at this conference. So I just have to build on that, sorry, because you <laughs> talked about Kodak, and I, you know, I worked in the research labs for 14 years. Um, so just on that one note, photography has completely changed the world. And the fact that all of us can take pictures on our phone and send them to somebody else has raised the level of communication in, around the world to a whole new level. And so I think you're right in terms of what our work is. And another plug for World Usability Day, the, the idea with it, well, because that's our idea, is to go out to the public. It's not to actually have more conferences for ourselves. It's to do activities so that the general public knows. So for example, we've done lots of activities in science museums on World Usability Day, just sorting socks having an activity where somebody stands at a table and sorts socks, and, and then you hear people standing at the side going, oh, I wouldn't have thought to sort my socks that way. Uh, and then you can start to get the people to understand. So I think it is these activities, like you're saying, that we need to go off and do. Yeah. I'm now, I've got, got downward-facing dog in my head. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> and as a, as a stiff British woman who can't yoga for my life. We get, yoga is a practice, I get it. <laughs> But I want, to be, I want to be slightly contrarian, just, just because. And I think one of the things we have to be a little cautious of is um, having everyone think that they can do research because it looks so easy. And I think, you know, obviously you are training folks, um, you know, in your context, and you're actually doing something really important, which is inspiring folks. But there is a, there, there, there's a, something that happens sometimes, which is I've seen... So, shall we say poorly executed results with inappropriate um, or you know ineffective conclusions being conducted by people who don't have good training and that comes out as research approved like a stamp and then we find out later that something terrible has happened potentially or it could be you know something benign it could be something seriously unintended consequences consequential and then, you know, research gets sort of, well, research was done on that. You should have known better. And in fact, when you trace back, it would have been really obvious to somebody with a trained eye mm -hmm. that this was, in fact, not the right conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be a little bit cautionary about the, the exporting of the belief that, or, you know, the, of, of skills that are poorly trained and the belief that that actually stands as research. And so as we're educating, as we're inspiring as we're helping others to learn, as we're influencing into perspectives. I think it's also very important to let people know that, you know, this is not, this is not a research-approved kind of thing. This is actually a serious business, and that there are some things you can actually research, you know, with very little skill and training and come up with the great conclusions, and that there, are, there are others which it's just inappropriate. I agree. I think we should distinguish about the different kinds of work. While I'm happy to see playful stuff of, you know, of game-related research. Um, the world that we're building now and that Elizabeth is... <laughs> Elizabeth, uh, uh, Elizabeth C. has uh, focused on, we're doing consequential things. It's life-critical applications, whether it's Boeing 37 Max, we, where we should have been more involved, or electronic health care and digital and, and medical devices, 
the things that in many cases we're working on are life critical and consequential, financial and other things. So for those, certainly higher degrees of caution are necessary. But I'm, I'm, I still want to sort of say I believe in the massification and dissemination of HCI and UX that everybody should do it. You know, just everybody should do it. And we'll do a little yoga later, uh, and, and you'll be able to do that too. Just don't, <laughs> don't ask me to do tree pose. Not happening. Let's take that as a gift. We all, I think we do believe the answer for that you. We need to walk, we need to reach out, uh, and maybe the model here is something like finance. We, anybody who works in a business organization, we expect to have a certain amount of financial literacy. Um, we even teach it to people in home economics mm -hmm. and teach them how to balance their checkbooks and create a budget. But we also have people who are professionals in finance who understand how to make the big decisions. The problem, I, I will say, a lot of my career has been in trying to teach HCI and UX to people whose worldview is very different from mine. And we have a culture uh, of ourselves, that, among ourselves, that I think we, we celebrate and we understand, which often seems very alien to people. Have you tried to talk to developers about user experience? design, my experience has been a lot of times they don't understand at all what we're talking about or why we're talking about it because their worldview is different. I think the same certainly applies to CEOs uh, and other senior managers who, to whom this is not even a blip on their screens. So I think I want to suggest that there is a very fundamental question here, which is how can we as HCI UX professionals improve our ability to communicate and influence stakeholders whose worldview is really different from ours. They don't want to hear about delighting people. They don't want to hear about the joy of design. They want to hear about cost effectiveness and making the business work, you know, uh, cost effectively and making money and revenue, and, and they just see things very differently. So just a building on what you were saying about hats, uh, the hat theory, I think that um, that's what we try to do uh, in our work at Bentley. So think about applying the principles of user experience to the project, right? So who's that persona? What is going on with them? A lot of what you were saying. Why are they so cranky? Oh, maybe they have a schedule. And what you're telling them is going to slow them down. So sit down and figure it out. If you don't know how to code, I'm not saying you have to learn, but at least understand the algorithm that, there's, that you're telling them to change and work with them. So it's, it's similar to what you were saying. What's going on and what's their backstory? Maybe they have a new baby and they haven't slept and they're cranky. Maybe, you know, like you got to understand who you're talking to to figure it out, to make it work with them. So I, I'll answer with a concrete story that's always stuck in my mind. Uh, it addresses the CEOs, how to get CEOs to understand. And it had to do with expense reporting. How many people will, will put in expense report after this trip? Raise your hand. <laughs> Keep your hand up if you're really looking forward to the experience. <laughs> Great. Exactly. So this was the project. Um, it was an expense reporting tool. And the CEO just didn't get it. Didn't, this, this needs no improvement. Let's not put any effort towards it. Well, when you went and talked to her, the reason was is because she had, she, it had been many years since she had done her own expense report. So the activity we designed was to have her do an expense report. Well, within 20 minutes, she was like, oh, wow, this is, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Nobody should experience this. So I, I'm a big believer in, um, I think, persuasion, verbal persuasion um, it works. I think most effective is um, getting people to experience it. So I'm with Elizabeth and the Stripes here in that you need to, um, that you really need to have people feel it and understand where they're coming from. Charlie makes the important point about reaching out to the corporate executives, government leaders, and so on. And I think that's really a good place to go. And we can approach them. And I think the suggestion you might make in your organizations, whether it's governments or, or, or business, is that there be a chief design officer in every organization. Johnny Ive, as that was at, at Apple, is famous for that. But the city of Helsinki, the city of Los Angeles, also have chief design officers. And those chief design officers uh, will propagate a fresh thinking. And, well, maybe let me tell you a vision for the future that I have. I, if you've ever been to Vienna, anybody from Vienna? We have any Vienna? Ah, thank you. There's a beautiful set of buildings that house the 
International Atomic Energy Agency. And I've been there and I've spoken about usability for the design of the tools they use. But that represents an interesting model. That was created by the United Nations because the most powerful and dangerous technology was atomic energy. So there was a need, an agreement internationally that we need an international atomic energy agency. I think we need an international usability agency. I think we need an international HCI. I think we need a world usability organization like World Health Organization because these technologies are arguably the atomic energy of our age. One of the speakers had made that comment earlier this week, and I think that's you know the, the level of impact that we have. Uh, you may know in 1938, Albert Einstein wrote a note, a letter to um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt suggesting that, you know, the Germans are working on this thing called atomic energy and maybe you ought to pay a little attention to that. It could be important for the, you know, for the, for the, for the future. And I think we're at the same sort of situation that some of us need to write a note to say, you know, uh, social media and the technologies of usability are determining factors for the future, and we ought to pay national and international attention to it. We ought to aspire to that level of influence because the dangers are there, as has been pointed out, uh, but the opportunities are there, and that's why we need to work on that. And I want to pick up on the chief design officer thing, because I actually, I'm not sure this is the right word, but I would prefer to have a chief research officer. And the reason being, especially in larger organizations rather than the smaller ones that we were discussing earlier, for very good reasons, there are many different kinds of research that don't talk to each other. So you have marketing research, which is a fantastic discipline and area that leads to all kinds of decision-making you know, at senior executive level. Then you have all of this uh, you know, usability research. You have strategic long-term foundational research. Um, Many, many, many different kinds, and, and we've seen the growth of quantitative research, behavioral analytics at scale, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you had a chief research officer, their role would be to actually look at where these different research streams, these different methods, these different approaches, these different, again, incentives, as I mentioned earlier, where they conflict and where they work together. What are the different kinds of data, and how do they come together I work with uh, product managers quite a lot. And one of the interesting things that one product manager said to me is like, I get three different people telling me three different things. I've got marketing, quant, and qual research. How do I synthesize? How do I come to a decision? I'm getting conflicting information. And I think we really need to have that kind of function in organizations, which is looking at different streams of research and then doing the critical, deep, analytical work, which is beyond really, really great skill set and craft into thinking about the synthetic in the context of the business objectives and all of these other moral and bigger picture direction uh, uh, issues that are coming, coming up. And I think, you know, Johnny Ive is a really great example of chief design officer because, because the context there, the, the inference there is it's all about the product. It's about this beautiful design of the product and actually, we are in the business of designing really deep relationships and designing societies, to your point, Ben. And so I want a chief research officer. Can I negotiate between the two of you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to propose that we have a design, the chief design, design researcher. And here's why. It's not just to make you too happy. It's actually, um, my reason is, is I think when we think about design research, we can think of two products of design, re two outputs of design research. Mm -hmm. One is theory. Mm -hmm. and ideas about how things work. And the other one is applications. Yeah. And I think both are critical. Can, I, can yeah. we come to agreement? Well, yeah. I well, support design research. <laughs> okay. I, I, I don't. <laughs> I, get, I, get, I get your point. But that was why I said I wasn't quite sure research was the right word. Okay. But the minute we start to inject the word design, which has a very specific uh, meaning in the tech industry very often, yes. okay. we in this room, sorry, we in this room, I think, think about design very in, a, in the large. Yes. But the fair. word is very different when I'm on the ground. Okay, so just to, what about, uh, I've heard, <laughs> now I've heard chief. We're now going to poll for words. Ex, 
Uh, Chief Experience Officer. What do you think of that? Does that do it or no? It does not. I'll stick with that. <laughs> Okay. I'm going to down with dog okay. with that one later. I, I think this brings up a nice point that we were actually talking to earlier, which is the challenge of language yes. in, in, in academia, in the industry, and that we all, I mean, the visceral reaction, did everybody see Elizabeth shiver there? Um, <laughs> the visceral reaction some of us have to terms, and this, I think this is, this is very problematic for um, young people navigating the field to understand. My advisor <laughs> thinks this is a good word, but the person hiring me thinks this is the it's worst really word. How do, we, how do I work between? Really good point. We have a bunch of people so, that want to want to add some comments, first. so let's go. Start let's in take the back. that in. She was first, yeah. And then we're... <laughs> uh, hello, uh, my name is Agnieszka Zwolinska from Warsaw, Poland. So I really appreciate your big ideas. They are very strategic. Uh, I can share my experience uh, from Poland. So I work as UX des designer. And uh, I have never met my CEO, so I can't propose uh, the role of um, chief design or research officer. <laughs> <laughs> but what I did is um, I asked for, because we have uh, three days uh, of onboarding for newcomers, and I asked for one hour uh, for um, UX onboarding. So I, uh, I trained more than um, 100 people, and developers, testers, business analysts and uh, HR also roles, uh, what UX is. Uh, so they are mm, maybe became uh, a little bit curious what it is. And they are coming after this uh, to ask about more. And the second thing is that I'm uh, inviting uh, my team, each role for usability test results. So that are very simple ways how we can um, communicate UX with stakeholders without uh, training. Thanks. Bravo for being a good yoga instructor. Yes, exactly. So there was another one. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Luca McKay. Uh, I'm an undergrad at Purdue University. Um, and I'm currently actually studying uh, user experience design there. And I was just curious, with the massification of uh, HCI and UX, wouldn't it make the most sense to try and teach it in like levels of like middle school and high school and try and get it to like into the curriculum along with like arithmetic? Yes. yes. Yeah, talk about working ourselves out of the job. Um, my, I have a nine year old son who is learning this, and I was in his class the other day because I'm the, I'm the designer that comes, the design parent that comes in, and I asked everybody who knows what a prototype is. Every kid raised their hand and gave me a pretty good definition. Um, and so I questioned, this is third grade, I questioned what, what I had to contribute to that group. Um, it, was, it was exciting. I thought this was wonderful. So, and, and just to build on that, I know um, that there are many design camps for kids now, and uh, one of my sons and now my nephew is going to go, and they, they have 3D printers, they're building oh, yeah. prototypes, they're <laughs> testing them with users. It's starting to happen in the camps in the summer. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right, though. Let's, move, let's see if we can move it into the actual schools. It's, the seeds are starting, though. And at the, the ACM level, there's a lot of efforts to go into schools with uh, more better computing teaching. And as part of that, teaching computing is also about the why. Why would you build this? Why would you learn this? What for? And um, accessibility is another thing. We've been talking a lot to bringing things like accessibility into the front of teaching CS, for example, mm -hmm. so that you don't like learn everything and then go, oh, by the way, there's this thing called accessibility. Oh, by the way, there's this thing called usability. Oh, by the way. So actually front loading some of that. So yeah, I think we're seeing, it's slow, but we're seeing some changes. It's a, this is an example of another way to interpret what this community has done. We have empowered people to yes. be creative. The idea that anyone can take a picture, that can send an email, can send a text, can make a video and have a million viewers is historically transformative. That's Charlie's pushing digital transformation. It's personal transformation. We've never had a time where in the time from my youth and, you know, from being a student to the time now where people are making things, they're creating things. They're not just, you know, they're not just absorbing, they're getting out of being couch potatoes, they're shifting towards a world where they are empowered to make things. And the next generation of activities will make, 
will enable them to make even more, but they will also not just make products, but make services and health care and compassion. They'll make a better environment. They'll make new social structures and political structures. We have to build the tools that enable people to make the world of the future. That's what we do. And they really make, back to Gillian, back to Dark Princess of Dystopia, and they may also start burning it down. So be let's be a little remember. And why are you wearing black? <laughs> we got a lot of questions here, so. Okay, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Anna Weller from City University of London, and I was just wondering if you had any tips and hints for um, weaving compelling and creative, uh, or creative and compelling ways to weave sustainability goals into conversations about um, the things we're designing and why we're designing them, and how we can, you know, in, in being these kind of proponents of UX, we can actually make that part of the uh, of the. Um, uh, conversations that we have with people that don't know so much about UX? That's a great question. So um, as a way to keep this narrative going and to connect to the sustainable goals, uh, I encourage you to think about examples um, that you may have with certain case studies. So mm -hmm. the first one that I thought of a while back was um, overall. So the sustainable goals have 17 different levels, and some of them you know, are big and, and, and small, and they, and they hit on different things. But if we just think about one, um, I know some of the, um, well, I'm being recorded, so I'm a little, so let's say we have, can I just hold your phone for a second? Let's say we have something like this that we keep designing, but we have to keep throwing it away. So that's not necessarily sustainable, but is there something we could do to think about making this modular or evolvable or some other way that we in our world can help suggest that is just one example. But if you think about, again, acting locally, what are you doing in your projects? And look at the goals and see where you can connect because better health care for all is one, you know? There's one about um, gender equity. There's like a lot, a lot of places that you may already be doing things. So just think about where you can connect the dots and then come up with case studies for that. Like once you start connecting the dots, you'll, you won't be able to stop. <laughs> we have responsibility to do that. Yes, thank you. Exactly. Thank you. I think, I think one of the so, issues yeah. in all of this is we need to get our language straight. You know, yeah. to to get a panel here, you have to go through a rather exhausting and <laughs> uh, quite difficult review process. <laughs> And uh, one, of the, one of the things that the review has said that, that they resonated with was the fact that we don't seem to have a common language for talking to other people about what we do. I mean, look at this. We here in this conference have are either HCI or UX. And there isn't a common term for this. And, and we don't, you know, we use words like design, you know, and I could tell you I really like the design of, of your boots, um, and that means something very different from the way that we use design. Right. And mm -hmm. so we are going to need to find ways to communicate these concepts in ways that are really basically intuitive uh, to people and, and, and do resonate with them. Uh, so I, I think that is sort of a, a problem that we haven't been terribly successful. Uh, maybe that's I'm not sure why that is, a, is the case. And I think, you know, we've been, what's the term, divided by a common language or something? Mm -hmm. You know, language is just hard. Um, and I think that <clears throat> the problems really start when people use the same word and think they mean the same thing, and they don't, which is why it's got to be dialogue and illustration. Mm -hmm. Example, like your example of the CEOs, it's like, that's, you know, I can describe something, but you don't feel it. It's like I can say a word like conversation. We have conversational interfaces that are profoundly not conversational. Um, you know, it, it's how do you actually start to really talk around a word until somebody understands what you really mean? And that means real deep dialogue. Oh, and by the way, I just wanted to say, I want to, if any of the reviewers are in the audience, despite what Charlie said, the comments were actually super, super, super helpful. They were terrific. And so, you know, it was a, a difficult process. You know, it was like trying to 
uh, understand what was intended and try to respond, but I thought the reviewers were absolutely excellent and really yes. helped to, to shape this. So if any of you in the audience, thank you. Yeah. Yes, they, the reviewers yeah. actually were absolutely helpful and terrific, and it was a, a great experience, if a little exhausting. <laughs> Hi, just a question. Daniela Busse from Oracle. I wanted to get back to the World uh, Usability Organization from Ben, what he mentioned, the big, bold goal. <laughs> I think maybe usability itself is maybe not the perfect framing, given it's just sort of like a slither of the things that we actually have to consider. But I also just wanted to give for consideration that I work a lot with design and in design, and there is a World Design Organization. There's lots of national design councils that work on policy level with national governments. They work across regions across nations um, already very much ingrained. Um, and I wondered, what's on the HCI, the HCI, uh, CHI, ACM level? Is there anything equivalent in that respect? So let me just address the World Usability Day. Um, so it's an interesting, just building on this language problem. Um, so the idea when I started was usability was what we all do right now. It was, it was that, and, and I guess I, I believe it still is that. Um, the problem is as we've grown in a, as a field, we've started dividing what I call our little pie into smaller pieces. So if we, if we have to keep doing that, I, I just think it's not sustainable personally. So usability is what, again, World Usability Day was not about us talking to each other. It was about us getting the word out to the world. So when you talk to people who aren't in our field, they don't really understand the difference between user experience, usability, information architecture, user interface design, visual design, research, and usability is, in my experience, and we did a little survey early on, usability is people say, oh, you mean easy to use. Oh, I got that. And that is a concept that the rest of the world gets. And so that's the reason we hung on to that word. Um, design research, as you just saw a few minutes ago, <laughs> isn't so straightforward. I love both of those, but I think if we're talking about getting it out to the rest of the world, I think the use, I'll, I'll still stand by my thoughts on usability, um, but it's a good question, and I appreciate you raising it, uh, especially because then I get to say what I just said. <laughs> and, and also, you, you asked about ACM um, and SIG CHI level, right? Um, and actually, the, the CHI 2030 visioning task force that uh, we're on, um, I hope some of you managed to get there. Daniela, I know you, you, you came along with me. And if you notice, we had these tiles, and the tiles were, you know, what would we kind of want for 2030? And a number of those were about how do we not just talk to ourselves, to Ben's earlier comments, but also talk outwards, mm -hmm. building on the kind of model for world usability, from World Usability Day. And, and two, two or three years ago in Toronto, when Kai was in Toronto, we had open to the public. We had the open to the public day where Bill Buxton had brought a bunch of his mm -hmm. artifacts. Unbelievably successful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we want more and more and more of that but we're not there yet, and so again, I thank you for coming and uh, you know helping us with the 2030 and putting your vision down, because hopefully some of that will be in what you articulated there. And that's a good segue for us to begin talking about our final set of questions, which is how do you envision the future of what we're doing? So I know Jeff was, you saw the question? No. no. And did you have a question or a comment? Martin. Martin, did you? So Martin Ramser, Linköping University. Uh, I would like to connect the last topic with also the, the discussion of scalability, that the tools and the platforms kind of scaled. And I would suggest that we have the same uh, tools and platform for communication. Mm -hmm. So how do we reach, not only have management understanding, but also management support? And that's just an easy kind of checklist of these are the top arguments to get your CEO on board. So that's kind of just a simple tool for having the scalability. Do you have that already? Can we share that? I'll mail you later. Okay. <laughs> yes, please. We yes, all please. want it. I, I, I just want to comment. Has anybody heard of Atul Gwande's checklist in the, in the emergency room? I'm really, I've been amazed by that as a designed yeah. object. Um, because it's it's a simple it's a simple checklist that my understanding has radically uh, reduced the number of errors, and it's a checklist, yep. and it it draws attention. And I, I think this brings back to the very early comment we were having about opening opening the doors, um, and drawing attention, and and knowing that there will be some misinterpretation. Yep. 
hopefully on the whole there will be broader understanding and engagement. Yeah, we've been, we, very concrete example. We have a thing called Happiness Tracking Survey, HAPS. Um, HAPS, Happiness Tracking Survey. Oh, so, you know, when you, uh, you're you doing something and, some, and you get a little question pop up and say, you know, how do you feel about this, blah, 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 right? Really interesting because um, a bunch of our uh, product managers and engineers were really interested in actually taking up this, this up as a method. Um, quick training. One of the folks on my team, um, her name's Abla Hamilton, she was like, wow, I'm really noticing that uh, they're, they're using these surveys way too frequently and the interpretation isn't quite right. Mm -hmm. And she said, that's on me mm -hmm. to create a checklist. Mm -hmm. And she created a lovely mm -hmm. deck, which was to explain <coughs> to these folks who hadn't been trained in surveys mm -hmm. um, why you would do something this way rather than that way. But I loved that initiative that she took where she didn't say, oh, they're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. She said, oh, that's on me to explain mm -hmm. it and to give them a checklist, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it was just a beautiful example of that kind of uh, activity that you talked about earlier of sharing these methods and then iterating on when you have not well necessarily designed or fully designed mm -hmm. the sharing of the method. Um, so that was a nice example. Okay. Uh, Jeff Johnson again. Um, so getting back to Charlie's point about uh, talking to the CEO and sort of trying to convince the upper management, uh, we heard, by the way, in, the, um, in Dan Rosenberg's talk uh, a few days ago about how he had done that at Oracle. So that was um, a useful talk, I thought. But, but what, if hap what happens if the CEO says, I get what you're saying, we need to make this easier to use. In fact, we need to go beyond ease of use. We need to make it so easy that people can't put it down. We need to make, because that's how I make money. We need to make it so easy that people can share anything with anyone, whether that what they're sharing is true or not. What, what happens if you, that's a sort of a success failure in a sense. How do we, how do we deal a with that? financial success, but an ethical failure. Certainly. I think it comes back to case studies. I mean, I think we are becoming more literate in understanding how some of those kinds of decisions um, play out negatively down the line. Certainly at my company, digital well-being has become a really major, major initiative in, in re response to concerns that some decisions that are made with one set of incentives actually lead to more problems down the line. And I think we now have case studies, and in my experience, um, senior executives are very sympathetic to hearing that that kind of incentive structure isn't the right one necessarily, and that to be critical and reflective. And uh, you know, I think we just have to be more vocal about supporting that. Yeah, case studies are very effective to illustrate a lot of this. Um, because if you have one, especially to the point you were making of, this is making the company a lot of money, but there's unintended consequences that are hurting people, then you can start to walk out, well, what's the cost benefit, right? And is there really an ROI at the end of the day if you ride it out that far? Look at a few case studies, start to see what's really the business strategy with that. Maybe it's a short-term win by selling a lot or letting a lot of people on a platform. But if we see evidence, so it's got to be evidence-based, that's what yes. the case studies, then you can start to walk it out. In my experience as a consultant, CEOs, anyone in the C-suite, data, <laughs> evidence, case studies, they'll, they'll understand that. So it's building them that's the challenge. We got some. Hi. Uh, Daniel, I'm a user researcher at Uber. Um, when... Uh, organizations like behave badly with like finance, the SEC goes after them um, like for like immoral, unethical actions. Could you envision like an SEC uh, type organization for HCI uh, with these kinds of behaviors uh, like you know around engagement that are kind of getting out of, out of control for several? Absolutely. I th I, I, there are four scenarios about how this 
can play out. I've proposed a, you know, the, I, I built on the model of the National Transportation Safety Board, which is quite respected and successful, and I propose a National Algorithms Safety Board, because I think the dangers now are inherently more on the algorithm side. They're also on the HCI side. And so I think we'll see the emergence we are already seeing within the Food and Drug Administration, Federal Trade Commission, uh, National Institute of Health, uh, SEC. Each of those are developing the expertise and the skills for doing that. The second strategy for making happier outcomes and dealing with these problems are the large-scale audit uh, firms, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, KPMG, Deloitte, and so on. Those companies are now taking up the role and seeking to become the arbiters of the future for the organizations that they audit on an annual basis. As you may know, in the U.S., every publicly listed company must conduct internal and external audits each year. The third will be the insurance companies who will then become active insurers as they have positively had a role in design of buildings um, and, and making them fireproof and safe, etc. They, I think, will also begin uh, to play a role there. And then the third, Elizabeth spoke about, I do think there are virtuous corporate leaders uh, that are speaking the partnership on AI, for example, is I think a virtuous group that is trying its best to, within a corporate framework, do that. Corporations are dangerous. They can be evil, but they are the forms of, of transformation of building a new world. We should not be, and I would like this community to be more engaged with business. I think we need to face the challenges of working on real problems at scale and doing your research not in the lab, not on Mechanical Turk. I mean, those may be good starters, but get out there at scale, do it. We never before had the tools to be able to do that kind of evaluation, and we should be doing it. And let me say, in closing moments, I just ask you to envision 100 years from now uh, and, and the, the slowly building momentum of HCI, usability, design, research, and so on will become recognized as a dominant force. We will become, long after AI has receded into being the astrology or, astro or, or alchemy <laughs> of the 21st century, uh, HCI usability, user experience, will emerge, I believe, as the transformative power for this century and for the next century. And I encourage you to be leaders in that positive movement. The reason we've done it, because I, it was just my opening statement, we attended to universal usability, diversity, inclusiveness. We looked at different kinds of people. We wanted to serve their needs. We were compassionate. We had an emotional connection, and we really wanted to build the world in a better way. It wasn't about the technology. It was about serving human needs. You're on the right track in many cases here. Keep at it. We're going to have a happy future. And remember, some people might need to be gated. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for but the balance. Just there, yeah. Just there. But, I, but I do think that it's really, really important that we celebrate and we also take deep responsibility mm -hmm. for leading the conversation. I, want, I really want to celebrate, but I also want to be clear that we have to also lead the conversation. Yeah, I, we, we have come to the end of the... The panel, I want to say that, you know, I, I mean, I can't thank the panelists enough. I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, the reviewers who put such hard work into all of this and all of the volunteers that have just put this tremendous event together. I mean, I'm just awed at, at the amount of work and thoughtfulness that's gone into it. Um, so uh, let's go out and, and, and make HCI and UX a world force for good. And thank, thank you, you, Charlie. Charlie, thank you for leading this. Thank you. Thank you.